The following is a conversation. It has the features of any conversation, such as imperfectly expressed thoughts, ill-considered opinions, and the notions of several sleep-deprived brains. Try not to get your stethoscope in a twist about it. Initially, before their interview, their writing really matters to bring forward empathy and, you know, really add a lot of depth and detail and reflection into their writing so that we can get to know them and we can, you know, learn what did you take away from this experience? Why was it impactful to you? How did it help you to know that this is the way that you want to help people in the world? And that's a tough thing to do through writing. Meandering in the margins of medicine, it's the Short Coat Podcast. Weird news, fresh views, helpful clues, and interviews. By students, for students. Subscribe to our weekly show at theshortcoat.com. Welcome back to the Short Coat Podcast, a production of the University of Iowa Carver College of Medicine from the students drinking from that fire hose. I'm Dave Etler. With me today in the SAP studio, a man who is as articulate as they come. It's uh, M3, Eric Bozart. Hello. Talking with him is one of life's greatest pleasures. It's M4 Mason LaMarche. Hello, Dave. A chat with her is like being inside a wondrous sun shower of communication. It's M3 Ananya Munjal. Hello. A discussion with this woman is engaging, enlightening, invigorating. It's M3 Maddie Walling. Hi, everybody. And she's a superlative talker, listener, all around communicator. It's our admissions guru, Rachel Shulista. Hello. Ananya. Hello. You are not here with us, and I don't know if you've been on the show since you left the building. I have not. Where where are you? What are you doing? I'm in Baltimore. I am doing a dermatology research fellowship at Hopkins. What kind of... Is there a particular focus for this dermatology research fellowship? Actually, there is... Really not. It's a it's a it's like one that's kind of like combined between different mentors. So part of the fellowship is pediatric dermatology research, which is mm-hmm. really fun because I think that's what I want to do. And then part of it is CTCL research, which is cutaneous T cell lymphoma. And it's pretty mentor dependent. So I think that's just the mentors who I'm working with currently. Yeah. How's it going? It's great. It's really, really fun. It's very nice to be exploring medicine in a way that is not in the classroom or on a rotation and i think it's really i think i had done a little bit of research during my you know first few years of medical school but it's really nice to have the time to kind of do that in depth and i think also clinical research is something that at least in my experience is difficult to do when it's just like you know in the time that you have between rotations or you know after clinic i think more of the research experiences that you can have in your medical school years is like more translational so you know like chart review projects and things like that unless of course you're doing like a phd um so i think it's really nice to have the opportunity to start some projects and then see them through and devote you know 40 hours a week to that do you want to do are you looking to end up in baltimore I would be very happy to end up in Baltimore. I am looking to end up anywhere. Anywhere, <laughs> if I match, I would it's be a, happy. It's a trick question uh. and a trick answer. <laughs> Best not to close any doors. I, I feel very PR right now. <laughs> like I'm following a script. Well, I'm glad that you were able to join us for the first time in a while. Thank you for, Me too. Thank thank you for, you for coming. Me. I don't know if you guys realize this. You guys realize this? A lot of it is expected of doctors. A lot of what? A lot. Just a lot of things is expected of doctors. You you have to be highly knowledgeable. You have to be able to give your knowledge to others effectively, i.e. teach. You have to be super organized. You have to be possessed of deep compassion and and highly responsible and professional and beyond ethical reproach. You have to be adaptable. You have to be detail-oriented. You have to be strongly inclined to leadership. Guess think about this. Did I did I did I freak you out a little bit? It sounds like my med school application. (laughs) I haven't thought about it in a minute. Sounds like a lot that we read. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I feel like that's how I think of of doctors, and I I don't know if it's because I've spent the last twenty years hanging around with, you know, in in medical school, or if it's a real thing. I think it sounds absurd when you say it that way because it's so long, (laughs) and like no one, no one is any, no one is all of those things. You can't be all of those things. Yeah, I feel like there's ones that are more important or yeah. more, yeah, the the ones that you absolutely should be. Yes. Well, you know, the the reason I list all these is because I feel like there is one quality that sort of underpins many of those. You've got to be, you know, strong communicators. You know, like compassion isn't really possible 
unless you understand your patients, your colleagues or where they're coming from. You've, you've gotten that mm-hmm. sort of communication from them and you're taking that in. You can't receive or give your knowledge well without strong communication skills. Much of professionalism is about effectively representing your profession through effective communication. Even what you wear communicates something important to the people around you, although I effing hate that. (laughs) Um, What's that? Yeah. Med bikini. (laughs) Yeah. I I mean, you know, I don't want to take it. I don't want to take it that far because that's dumb. But uh, yeah, I mean, you can't lead without signaling where it is you want others to go and why it's important to get there. And so that's why I thought we would talk about communication skills and and how you, you know, how you learned them, how you practice them with your patients and with your colleagues, what you look for as feedback when things that to decide whether things are going well or aren't. So I thought we would start at the most obvious place in which these soft skills are important. And I I also don't like soft skills either because I think they're way too important to be called soft skills, which I think has a connotation that is unnecessary. But working with patients, what do you what do you learn about communicating effectively with patients? What do we teach you explicitly? We actually get taught, I believe the acronym is nurse yeah. Uh, we get taught like how to be empathetic and how to show empathy. I don't remember what nurse stands for because I feel like empathy is something you either have or you yeah. do not. But but the opportunity to practice it is like, I mean, it's worthwhile. It's a worthwhile exercise. Yep. So, so it, okay, let's start there with empathy, right? I, as a component of communication. I think you can practice empathy. You can, but I... I I would say that it's something that you need to have some level of innately. Yeah. Yeah. I think the practice comes in like identifying appropriate, like when it's necessary. Yes. Like that's something that we get taught pretty well is like identifying, like, especially when you're in the CAPS program here at Iowa, the clinical and professional skills. Clinical. So the. It's like well, a three three a course or yeah. three semester course basically. Yep. yep. But the that's when I got exposed to a lot of that is like when you're in that the simulated patient rooms and mm-hmm. you're yep. like, all right, you said great following. Oh, I've been really depressed lately. Okay, great. How about <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's so true. One one simulated patient experience that sticks out to me is we learn i don't remember when in the curriculum we learned this but you're dealing with like an angry patient oh yes that's really hard actually and like if you've never done it in like a low pressure environment i i I don't know how i would react in a real situation with an angry patient and that's a common occurrence so i think that the opportunity to practice can't be like yeah overstated how important that is but i totally agree with eric that you need some level of innate communication ability and it's hard to say where that comes from yeah like yeah I, I think the other part of empathy isn't sort of emotional but sort of understanding where your patients live in their you know in their place in the world and and their expectations for their lives and and you know their I mean I think you can even take it as far as like hopes and dreams and stuff like that depending on the depending on the problem you are seeing yeah, Be- because you know, your patients will present to you with a problem that maybe you see as, oh, okay, they've got a broken leg or whatever. And you know, your first concern is, is f- fixing that. Mm-hmm. But also there's sort of, there, there might be sort of a deep down, a, 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 a layer below that concern for that patient who is like, well, can I do the things that I used to mm-hmm, do? And right. when will I be able to do that? And which I think gets to sort of identity. Yeah. You know, I am a, you know, maybe somebody's a runner. Yeah. And that's a big part of their identity. And, you know, when am I going to get back to that? Which is, yeah, it's a layer deeper than just the injury and just fixing it. Yeah. I don't mean to like stroke your ego too much, Dave, but I actually feel like another. I'm not going to protest if that's your intent. <laughs> well, it's, I'm going to stroke Kate's, Kate to Sherry's okay. ego a little bit. There we go. The Writing and Humanities program here, like, and you, as a student here, you get to choose how much you interact with the Writing and Humanities program. Mm-hmm. But I think that's a great opportunity to not practice your, you know, more soft, quote unquote, soft, soft skills. But it does. I feel like 
when I'm in the podcast and when I'm in uh, the writing elective with Kate and just in casual conversations with the humanities folks that kind of connects you back to the, you know, patient as a whole person rather than, a, you know, an injury presentation or an illness script. And so I think that that really helps. And I really appreciate that we have that here at Carver. A lot of reflection. Yeah. In that in that sense. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. This is why this is why I get a little frustrated when I hear people complaining about reflection. And part of it is because it's hard. It's it's kind of a hard thing to define yeah. what you're supposed to actually do. But yeah, I mean, it's important to sort of reflect on on what it is you're doing, what it is you're becoming, the the kinds of interactions you have with people, whether it's patients or colleagues or whatever, and and sort of decide, you know, am I, how am I doing? Yeah. You know? I think the other thing with empathy too, particularly speaking for specialties that don't see patients face to face, like radiology and pathology, man, I've seen so many pathologists cry after making a diagnosis. Like mm-hmm. that empathy doesn't go away just because you're not mm-hmm. talking with a patient. So I think like that's somewhere, there's something inherent to them that originally attracted them to medicine that even if they're not patient facing now, like, it was like built into the cake of their experience. So that's always kind of like important mm-hmm. to see. Mm-hmm. The other thing I struggle with is sometimes. And that's so important because pathologists and radiologists in particular have this, or pathologists in particular have this, I think, sort of reputation for being like mm-hmm. divorced from all of that. Which is crazy because our pathologists are just like the nicest, most lovely people who are just so funny to be around. So it's like they're not like hiding in a shell. Like they're so happy to have people around them. The other thing too with empathy is like it's really kind of like it's a tough skill to learn how to like connect with someone. But I also find like me trying not to project on people too much Mm -hmm. like if they broke a leg like i personally had a very bad experience with breaking a leg but for them it's just kind of like eh, it happened and making sure i'm not like oh my god this must be so awful for you and trying to like my empathy becomes pulling them down so it's always like reading the room that's a tricky thing i was gonna say well that's what you're talking about is like making a judgment as to what this person needs and wants from you yeah which isn't always easy but you know it's a it's a it's it's important to i guess try Mm -hmm. to figure that out I was going to say on that point, I think I, I think our empathy is like slightly limited to the scope of what we can, what we have experienced in a way. Mm-hmm. So I guess I was thinking about how like, so I'm, I'm like, I'm doing all this germ, you know, research and a lot of that's clinical. And I'm thinking like, so I, in Baltimore, I think we were talking about this before the show, but I'm just seeing like way more black patients than I'd ever seen. Like I see more black patients in like one clinic day than I've probably seen like on a full rotation, just like demographically, you know, compared to like med school. And it's, like we we know that we all like aspire or like most of us aspire to be culturally competent and we know how to like be actively like anti-racist and we know how to like you know use our biases to like counteract them but i think it's different when you don't like when you don't know what the experience of a person is to say certain things and a big thing i guess i'll really relate to dermatology is like we have a whole clinic for like ethnic hair and so there's like certain conditions that only affect black women and their hair so like and all most of the residents when they go in who are not black will like mess up you know the first time they're talking to a patient because we speak from our own experience so i'll say things like about washing my hair or i'll say things about things that i know that are specific to me when you know in trying to counsel a patient and then like i'll go to the attending who obviously is like well versed in these things and she'll be like well actually like black hair care they don't wash their hair like multiple times a week or like did you actually know that like some of the women that come in like the treatments they've had like it takes them like four hours to like care for it so it's like all these things that like you know i I don't have I didn't know these things so like it's hard for me to like speak to a person with what we can call empathy or we can call understanding or whatever you want to say when I can't like really understand that experience and then kind of like Maddie was saying about how we like quote unquote practice these things I think like the obviously like the more we learn the you know more empathetic we can become like Mason was saying like we don't know the experience of breaking a leg but like you speak to five patients and you can be like oh my god this is like awful like it takes weeks and weeks and weeks and like you if you're like we were saying if you're a runner you can't do that so then the next patient you encounter you can speak to them with greater empathy I remember I remember like on one of my rotations I can't remember what it was but we were talking about rapport building and the physician was like oh like if you can't think of something to say like you can ask them like oh how was your drive-in today and i've been thinking about that so much because just like demographically where i am right now it's like i think 80 percent of patients like don't have a car and so i was thinking like in one setting it's so easy to you know teach your students that like if you're like working in a private practice clinic or like i remember like my i think it was my family med preceptor and like the rotation i had in family medicine was just like in a very like you know, overly affluent area where like most patients were driving in and had access to a car and things like that. And so like in that area, it would be fine to say like, how's your drive in today? But like, I just can't even say that to like 80% of the patients that I see in a clinic day. And like, it's not really like a fault of somebody if they don't have, you know, like, I, I think it's, it's, it's different being on like, you know, uneducated to something as opposed to being unempathetic. So I think it's like, mm-hmm. it would be just like ignorant of me to say like, how's your drive in versus like, 
actively i don't think it makes like a person a bad person if they say that to somebody who like might not have access to a car or things like that i think it's just like a matter of the more you learn the more empathetic you can become i think a big part of that is educating yourself yeah absolutely rachel yes how do we look for these qualities in during the admissions process well i think initially it's tough because our first introduction to applicants is through their writing so we don't get to speak unless we've like spoke to them as prospective students, but in the act, in the active application cycle, we're reading their writing. And so a really common piece of advice that we share with prospective students or active applicants is that any time throughout the application process where you have the chance to write or to fill out a text box is a chance to share your own words directly with the admissions committee because they don't ever the committee, you know, they don't ever get to meet applicants in person. And so, you know, with different modes of communication for them initially before their interview, their writing really matters to bring forward empathy and, you know, really add a lot of depth and detail and reflection into their writing so that we can get to know them and we can, you know, learn what did you take away from this experience? Why was it impactful to you? How did it help you to know that this is the way that you want to help people in the world? And that's a tough thing to do through writing. That's definitely something that you know, I I think applicants struggle with because it's like I am limited to so many characters and I have to bring all of these things across and it takes time and practice even in the written sense too until you get to your interview and such. Written communication. Written communication. I didn't realize how big of a deal that was really until getting through Courier and really Mm -hmm. thinking about like how notes might impact patient care Mm -hmm. like that was a big realization like partway through core year where i was like oh man like this documentation that i'm putting together actually like matters to people in terms of like okay next time this patient comes in are is someone going to be able to read my writing and understand my thought process and i didn't i didn't realize the impact of that i'm like holy cow you know recently even from my own personal patient experience logging into my chart i didn't realize that i could like read comments yeah this is like a fairly new i was mm -hmm. shocked yeah shocked and like she was i was a hot mess in that situation and she (laughs) was the most graceful in her notes and i was like this is exactly what happened and i was impressed but i was like shocked that i could read what their comments were yeah that, like like i said this is a pretty new phenomena i think in medicine where patients actually have the opportunity to read their chart you know anything in their chart and so i think there was a period of adjustment not very long ago at all where you know physicians were like okay i have to do something different than what i used to do it's hit pathologists hard because they you know in the past would just write tubular adenoma which people with experience know is benign but now that patients can sometimes see the report before their doctor they're trying to frame you know yep. benign tubular adenoma and maybe they'll put a note you know explaining it's turned some non-patient facing specialties to have strong patient communication skills mm-hmm. in their written reports because yeah that written communication can get so scary there's just something recently where a private practice clinic sent out a message that was supposed to be a christmas oh message to oh everyone oh my god this oh my is god. this is an insane, insane story what okay happened? so for the yeah i was about to say for the uninitiated here yeah so they were gonna send like merry christmas to like all their patients but they accidentally sent out like a link to a hospice resource and it was like you've been diagnosed with like stage four lung cancer oh and no. so like many people freaked out some oh people like God. went to the clinic and eventually got sorted out to like they you know within a few minutes sent like sorry this is supposed to say happy holidays or whatever <laughs> Which is way different. Yeah. But some people had just... One patient who actually had cancer that they were trying to reach. And they're like, actually... It's not happy holidays to you. Like, yeah, for that one patient. But there were some patients who, like, were undergoing, like, chest studies. So, like, they were... There was a possibility that cancer was on the table. So, and not insignificant amount of people were, like, really phased by it. So, I think it's... Our written communication matters. I think probably the most of anything. Like, we spent a lot of time with, like, verbal patient face-to-face communication. But... Like it's pointed out, your notes last forever. So and now with patients getting to see them, like that's written communication is so important for med school applications, residency applications, and our day to day work. I have an appointment on Monday with a UIHC family medicine physician who I have not met before. Previous to this, my doctor was not at UIHC, mm-hmm. and I do not 
as far as I know, have access to the records that they use. So I'm kind of, now that you're, we're talking about this, I'm kind of looking forward to like using I, this as a way to evaluate my ability to work with this physician. I love reading the notes that physicians write about me. It's so fun. It's so, <laughs> so fun. fun. <laughs> I love like, you know, everybody has like a one liner, you know, Maddie is a blank, blank, blank. So I always look to see like if people call me pleasant, you know, polite. I don't know. I like I like the little to see what adjectives the doctors use to describe me in their one liner. Trying to score points on the note. (laughs) (laughs) Gosh, I'm trying to remember what she this particular physician wrote. But like I said, I was a hot mess in this situation. Very worked up. And in the notes, she was so graceful about it she was like patient was understandably anxious like something (laughs) like that where I was like that is nice. That is too nice for what I was. Yes. <laughs> Maddie is a pleasant but tearful 24-year-old. Yeah. <laughs> it's so funny because I, I actually am writing an essay about this exact thing and it's about, but it's kind of the inverse. It's like, I think we know the bad, the bad, you know, examples, but I think like what you're mentioning, it can be like actually very empowering, I think, to patients to like read like kind things about themselves like i remember like a patient had come in it was just like on my core year and they had like brought up to the physician like oh at the last visit i saw that you wrote that like like the, the physician had written in the note that like i had like full faith that like the patient will it was like some medication i have full mm-hmm. faith that the patient will like be diligent in taking their medication as like previously like you know they've done really well for like on previous medications and like the patient was like very like like not moved but like yeah i guess like strengthened by that they were like oh like i saw what you wrote in my note and like i really appreciated that like you know that like you have faith in me and i think it's like it's kind of like what we're saying that like we don't really know we don't or we're coming to realize like how important the words that we put on that piece of paper are and i was just going to give a second example really quickly also i remember on psychiatry i think every student got a lecture from and i'm forgetting her name her first name is emily she's like the director of the psych rotation uh-huh. but she gave this really good lecture about how like in our note the first thing we should write is like something kind about the patient like mm-hmm. we should like say something nice about them like even if like you know our interactions are short and even if like on psych you see some like really difficult you know conditions and therefore like personalities which are just like due to their condition and she's like you should just always like try to say something nice in that because other providers will read that note and like you're kind of and and this is so true like we and on Durham we do this too like in the clinic we'll look at the note and be like oh my god like this person brought up like five problem lists they're gonna be a difficult patient and we just like Mm -hmm. label them you set the tone yeah it's just the tone and like they like in clinic will like assign patients that way they'll be like oh like this is a difficult patient like because they have you know so many concerns and like it's just because, you know, I feel like there's ways to frame that. And all of this is based on a note that was written from, you know, it could have been like a year ago. It could have been like a few weeks ago. But like, I feel like there's ways to reframe that. And if we like started that note before with being like, oh, like, you know, so-and-so is like a, like you're saying, like the words that we use, a pleasant, like understandably distressed patient with like a long history of like severe psoriasis. And like, you know, of course, if I am reading that note, then I'll understand why this patient has so many concerns. Whereas like, otherwise you're just kind of setting that patient up for failure. In yeah. And I, I mean, what you're doing there is, is sort of signaling that you care about them you care about their problem you you're you're humanizing them yeah you're taking the time to understand them and and you know you're you're available it makes it i I imagine it makes them more likely to feel like you're available and that you can trust them and and that's an important it's probably the most important thing you can do with a lot of patients is is signal those things to them of course there's more to communication than working with your patients. I mean, you know, I think that's probably a lot of the way that we frame the discussion on communication skills. But there's also, of course, you know, in collaboration with your with your, you know, colleagues, Mm -hmm. which is super important as you and and we started talking about that with the note, you know, communicating Mm -hmm. with your your with people who will see this patient later. You know, you're doing things like, you know, you're sharing communication about goals and objectives for your work together. Your it means increased efficiency, monitoring and confirming progress, you know, towards goals. So th- do you do you have examples of of ways that that has gone well and maybe not gone so well in your personal lives? I can tell you every radiologist least favorite communication from a team is a study for a CT and all it says is pain. And that's one of the worst ways to communicate is like, it's so nonspecific. Like if you just walked past like, you know, your colleague in the hospital, like, Oh yeah, this patient pain. And then just walked away. <laughs> That'd be unacceptable. Like it's like, Oh, I guess I will see this patient with pain. So I think, yeah, that the communication sometimes is, and I know why doctors do it. Like it's just faster when you put in the order to just put this non-specific thing. But sometimes in our written communications, we don't necessarily think about 
the fact that we don't have a shared knowledge with the people we're communicating with. So you have to assume like we both are starting from point zero and work from there. But I think that's a, a particularly sticky point for radiologists who then have to like report back in largely only writing. And so I, yeah, I think you should important. respond with a similar one word response. Yeah. Like, abnormal yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> the study's not normal that's all you need to know like yeah. just get it just the equivalent of a k a k yeah when you send a paragraph like to your attending like explaining why you're going to be late to clinic and they just respond k yep. sent from iphone <laughs> yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah communication think, is finest yeah short coats we love to hear from you no matter what it's about so call us at 347 short ct with questions shower thoughts complaints about your situation whatever you like we'll talk about it on the show i think beyond verbal communication something that i think is really important is watching and like modeling how to treat trainees like at the highest Mm -hmm. level Mm -hmm. because that matters when you're on rotations and that matters when you're trying to decide where you want to go to residency i remember or i've heard about like oh, you don't want to be on rounds with this person because yep. they X, Y, Z. And it's like, is that like, that's not a reputation that you want to have for yourself, that you that you don't want the medicines around you because of the way you treat the trainees. And I think it it's all trickled down, right? Yeah. Because I think that that was the biggest, that I, I'm, I'll do my best not to name drop any specific yes. rotations. Here. Yes. But like there, there are certain rotations that I observed where I'm like, you stop getting the positive feedback or like the public positive feedback. And it makes such a difference in the vibe in the room, especially as the lowest person on the totem pole where you're kind of sitting there listening to a resident that is also still learning Mm -hmm. about whatever they were doing. And they're just getting not, you know, either berated or they're like, look, you didn't do great. You could have done so much better. And there's no like, oh, but you did this well. Right. You're sitting there like, this is terrible. Yeah. I hate being in this room right, right. now. I, 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 my story is, you know, I was seen by a physician and a resident. I don't know what year the resident was or anything like that. Mm-hmm. And this was a while back. And I can't remember exactly what happened, but the resident said something that the attending did not agree with and the attending freaking blasted that resident right in front of me and i was like i want i wanted so bad to leave not just because i was embarrassed for this resident but because i was disgusted yeah by this style of teaching yeah i mean what a turnoff yeah Yeah. it like i said it it can turn off like you said, it changes the whole vibe and it can turn somebody off of a particular specialty just from one bad experience, which may not be fair, but like that's just the fact of the matter. So I just think that like the way that you treat your colleagues, people are yeah. going to pick up on that. And and the way that you are treated as a colleague is how you're going to treat other people. A hundred percent. I went. It made me go out of my way to tell that resident like, hey. From a student's perspective, you did a great job. You helped me with <laughs> That's well, very nice of you. Well, yeah. like you you helped explain your decision making process when I asked. Yep. You helped me with like it was a surgical procedure, but it was like, all right, you helped me close you know, you helped explain how to suture or like what I could do better. Like you did a good job. Like that's the one thing that I can do in that situation is be like, Hey, you from my perspective, you did great. You know? Love it. I think like one of the most malignant things in medical education is the hierarchy. And I think like a lot of the things that we're talking about are like in reference to the fact that I think the hierarchy is just almost completely, if not like significantly reinforced by communication patterns and Mm -hmm. communication styles. And like, you know, like just, I'm thinking of like the like attendings on certain rotations that like if a med student is presenting, they're looking at the resident and like, you know, like little things like that are also like part of communication or like, a lot of women in medicine talk about like, you know, like when they're talking, like people are looking at the mail with them in the room, like even like patients. And like, I think a lot of that are like the kind of, you know, the silent components of a, you know, interaction that are beyond like, you know, beyond just like yelling at a, you know, yelling at a student or yelling at somebody, which is also obviously like extraordinarily malignant. The other things that are kind of like the micro, what is not even a microaggression, the micro communications, I guess, that Mm -hmm. like kind of surround. So just these nonverbal communications that are just such an important, I mean, what's the, I've heard this like 
figure I'm going to make it up because I don't remember exactly what it is, but like s- some percentage, some high percentage of communication is nonverbal. Yeah. yeah. And uh, you can say one thing and contradict that completely mm-hmm. based yeah. on your verbal communication skills yeah. or nonverbal communication skills. This happens all the time when I'm presenting to attendings. If they look like they're like bored or looking around, immediately I'm thrown off and I start sprinting through my presentation. They may be like, yeah. oh, slow down or don't miss this. It's like, I don't know. You yeah. seem it not interested. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Uh, So like you're trying to like get them back on board. So yeah, that's a thing where it's not like they're like, sometimes they'll say like speed it up and that's actually kind of helpful information. But when they're just like looking around and you're like, oh man, this is not going well. That's a stressful form of micro communication. Yeah. I feel like you should throw in that situation. You should just throw in something absolutely absurd to see if they are paying. They grow a third leg. Yeah. yeah. (laughs) But it's also the, the inverse I feel like is true as well as when that happens. And then they also give the... Oh, you did great. Like, did I? Yeah. I did, sure. what, was the information I said helpful? Because it yeah. definitely doesn't feel like that. Yeah. At the patient facing level, I'm thinking about we and I guess this kind of goes back to like efficiency and things. But we are taught not to like be writing the note while we're seeing patients. And sometimes when you're in the clinic, you'll see providers who are writing notes while they're talking yep. to patients and you see the power of like of how the body language thing it's like you're nodding your head you're like "Mm -hmm, yeah like you're trying to empathize while you're trying to type notes like that doesn't really work how do i know as a patient that you're listening to me if you're not looking at me if you're not like you know attempting to make a connection i think eye contact is like not weird eye contact you can't be weird but if you're like you know (laughs) normal eye contact i think that's super important as a patient (laughs) but i've had that in personal experience like i was i was at a neurology appointment and the guy he was a super nice guy did not make eye contact with me the entire appointment and i was just typing up his note and i'm like this makes me feel so insignificant right like it does you feel unheard yeah yeah but you can go back into your note later and see if it's right (laughs) yeah (laughs) yeah i was thinking about like the setting also like I don't know if you had, I feel like in some of my rotations, like, you know, like the attending switches over and then the new attending just like does things completely different. So we would switch from like doing bedside rounds, which is, I'm thinking, I guess, mostly of inpatient specialties. Mm-hmm. So you like one attending would do bedside rounds, which is like where you present the patient in front of the patient. And then like the next attending would do like, you know, table rounds or like, you know, they do their rounding in the group room. And I feel like that also like changes the communication so much. I don't know, like what's, there is no better really. I think it depends on like, you know, the patients and like maybe the context that you're in, but like, it's kind of like compared to what Dave was saying about like, you know, you're in the room and like the attending is like yelling at the resident that compared to like that happening behind closed doors makes a difference. Mm-hmm. And then like, you know, sometimes it's the other way. Sometimes like, especially on peds, like, you know, the parents want to know everything. So you're like, mm-hmm. typically at, at least I was like presenting mostly like in front of the patients and like, then there's like a third component that's part of the conversation and that completely changes the communication um and like the way you deliver information like you know sometimes when you're obviously behind closed doors attendings want to hear everything in medical terms but then like obviously when you're like in front of a patient you're talking like very straightforward and that also kind of like changes things and like how open you can be in different scenarios code switching yeah is the term i've heard for that Mm -hmm. yeah it's pretty important. And, you know, you, you got, you, you reminded me that, you know, when this attending was yelling at the resident in my presence, I was like, so, so how much teaching actually happened there? You know, like yeah. even if, even if there was important information to convey, surely that resident did not learn anything other than I, I don't want to say anything in front of you. This yeah. Yeah. Now. Yeah. <laughs> you know, <sighs> I think there's multiple, like, parts to it first is like you don't have to just be like that to anybody like even if somebody like yeah. something egregious like there's no reason to respond to that with that kind of you know violence or like whatever you want to call it but i think the second part is like the active intent to like humiliate which is just like to say something in front of a patient is so unnecessary like the exact same conversation even in the same malignant tone could have been done like outside of the room so i think i don't know that's like kind of a part of it also i think something to anania that you're that i think could be grouped into that conversation that was a big thing for me especially the last like two three months on courier where you're in some of the more heavier i was in more of the heavier inpatient rotations is like the leadership communication style like i think that that plays a big role into kind of what you're talking about like the the efficacy of the team because that's essentially what we were all on right is especially as a student like I, I really started to see that is like the hierarchy is a team of some kind, right? So you've got your 
medical students, you've got your residents, you've got your chief resident, and then you've got the attending, right? And like, depending on the leadership styles of your attending or your chief resident drastically changed the efficacy of the team. Yeah. Like, it was just crazy. It was crazy how little changes, like like you were saying, table rounds versus bedside rounds completely changed the efficacy of that. Yeah. The communication for med students and residents is weird, but particularly for med students, because we have to learn how to fit into these teams that maybe form for two to four weeks for us. Yeah. And then within four weeks, they might change halfway through or mm-hmm. that's always such a a tough spot. I guess I didn't appreciate before med school is like, it's not like when you're on internal medicine, you're just doing internal. Like there's so many variables and it's just oh, exhausting. hundred percent. I a hundred percent agree with it that. It was so but nice. Man, what a, what a, what an environment to learn communication skills in. I yeah. mean, it's like constant change, constant adjustment. I feel like rotations would be a great place for like improv people to mm-hmm. practice their skills. Yeah. Because <laughs> sometimes that's what it feels like. It feels like a performance almost sometimes. Yeah. You know, you don't need any medical knowledge sometimes to pick up on those oh, skills. 100%. Like, what do I need to say? How do I need to act? All of that yeah. nonverbal stuff. How that, many like, times did you go into a morning rounds presentation maybe not having reviewed or feel like you're 100% comfortable with something and be like, all right. Time to exude confidence. Yeah. yeah. Throwing, throwing caution to the wind. Here I go. Yep. You know, it really is a lot of like yes ending. Like, it, it really is. is a lot of that. Yeah. 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 There's a lot of sort of career goal things that rely on on these skills too. you know, like if you're a researcher getting grants. You know, you mm-hmm. have to be able to communicate. You have to be able I mean, what you're doing is selling an idea to somebody mm-hmm. and that is heavily, you know, dependent on good communication skills. Even just talking to people about a potential new way of doing things. You know, inertia is is a, I don't know, it's a pretty strong component of, of human organizations. Mm-hmm. And, and being able to use language and communication to overcome institutional inertia is pretty, probably Huge. a skill that most of us lack mm-hmm. <laughs> i think one innately of the, you know we talked a little bit at the beginning of the episode about reflection i think the biggest one of the biggest things about reflection when it comes to communication is like what do i want to get out of this conversation right. or this communication that i'm trying to do whether it's a note whether it's a conversation with a colleague whether it's conversation with a patient like and what do they want to get out of right. it mm-hmm. is huge yep. if, do you have any well i i suppose maddie you might have experience do you, have you ever done a grant i just submitted my first grant Ooh. in december it Ta- was horrible tell me about <laughs> tell me about that well it was a training grant and so Not only do you have to sell your research, but you also have to sell yourself and your potential, I guess, as like a future independent investigator. Why why should I why should you give me money? Yeah, I honestly I thought the hardest part was talking about myself and like Mm -hmm. my what I bring to the table and why I'm the perfect you know person to do this project because that's what you need to do when you're trying to get a training grant. So yeah, I found that that was the most challenging thing and like that kind of goes back to what you were talking about with the admissions, whatever we have to write. Applications, geez. Personal statements. Personal, yeah, personal statements, personal thank statement. you. And yeah. then again for residency like, application. Right, yeah. right, how do I convey my passion for the topic, my, you know, my own research skills, my, the setting that I'm in, how do I convey all of that succinctly because there's page limits and also in like 14 different ways because they have like a ton of different documents that are required Mm -hmm. and it's basically 14 different ways of saying the same thing (laughs) and it was a lot do you the research uh, part was the my favorite part and the easiest part honestly like the writing down what i want to do yep do you i mean obviously you don't know the results of this grant no application yet not yet how do you feel about where you did, did you get help yeah. So my PI, Mary, was like super helpful and supportive of the whole thing. And uh, Dr. Packiam, who's a urologist that I'm working working with, they were like super helpful with the research part. I certainly couldn't have done that without them. And Mary was like really, really great in helping kind of like proofread my stuff or, you know, you should beef this up. You should really highlight this because I think it it shows why you're perfect for this and not, not like just I was... I kind of lean toward the generic stuff where she's like, no, this is something that is specific to you that would make your ability to do this grant 
seem really impressive and things yeah. like that. So that was really helpful is having somebody who obviously knows mm -hmm. what a reviewer is looking for. And I, I was also taking a grant writing course at the time over at the College of Public Health, which I found to be helpful as well because I was getting a bunch of feedback from my peers, again, mostly on the actual research strategy, which is important. I think that like that's what gets scored, like weighed most heavily. But yeah, it was hard. It's hard to talk about yourself and yeah. to try to sales pitch yourself and your ideas because obviously to you it just makes perfect sense the other thing that i think was really hard and i think this applies to medicine outside of research talking about something that i know very well because i've spent a lot of time with it and trying to communicate the intricate like details of it to people who may not have the same background in like epidemiology as i do mm -hmm. or my my project focuses focuses specifically on bladder cancer and I'm trying to summarize this like 10 year history of drug shortage which has gone on that I know a lot about that requires maybe like two sentences of introduction for me that many people probably don't know about so one of the best things that one of the best pieces of advice and things that I picked up along the way is just have as many different people read your things as possible because they're going to point out different stuff because they are coming at it from a different background which is also always a difficult thing to to take in because oh my gosh there's there is such a thing as too much feedback <laughs> and everything is subjective yeah right to your reader and where they're coming yeah, from. yeah and then you have to serve and, and this is a common complaint for just people who are you know doing their rotations is you know i get you know one, one person said i did a good job and then the other person said i didn't do a good job oh yeah you can have a that, one sentence that two different reviewers look at that are like this is the worst sentence i've ever read yeah. it's like i really <laughs> yeah. like how much detail you put into this sentence and i'm like yeah. okay yeah, Great. I, I come across this when I come across this when I'm when I'm doing MSPs and and medical student performance evaluations. These are the evaluations that students that that we write about students as they apply to as they start to apply to residency programs. And I see this all the time. People who, you know, one resident or attending will say, you know, this person is awesome. And then the other another t attending or resident will say you know, this person needs a lot of work. And as the student reading this, I mean, ideally you're supposed to take this information and integrate it and use it to get better. And what do you do with that? Do they cancel out? Do they, <laughs> you know? And it comes yeah. at the end of the rotation before you have a chance to really like think about how you would apply it in that scenario. Right. Oh, Maybe I have so yeah. many thoughts about that. That's oh, another, yeah. that's another podcast. <laughs> Shortcoats, if you're enjoying our conversation today, I'd be grateful if you'd let people know by posting a story on Instagram or Facebook or tweeting about us. And don't forget to tag us in your post. Yeah. Thank you. How do you how do you evaluate your own interpersonal skills? This is the thing that when I was thinking about talking about this is, you know, it's really hard to self-evaluate. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so how do you how do you do that? I thought that there were certain rotations that did it better than others. I thought the ED did a great job of doing evaluation because they'll they sit down with you at the end of the shift and they'll say, "Look," or I should say, that I had a resident who was <laughs> I had a singular I, resident. I, I did. I, I had a singular resident that I really enjoyed working with. He was a senior resident. He was just finishing up. He was going to go. He had his job lined up in Wisconsin. and But he he made a point, if you worked with him, to sit down with you at the end of the shift and, you know, kind of went through like, okay, what did you do? What is something that you felt that you did well today? What is something that you feel could be improved on? Mm -hmm. And what, you know, in a very non-confrontational way, like it was a, a genuine like, hey, let's take a minute. Let's reflect what what did we as a group do? Well, what did, you know, what do you think could be better? And I thought that that was it almost forces you to be like honest with yourself. That's mm -hmm. awesome. Yeah. And the, was, it's things like that that you pick up on that. You're like, oh, I hope to do something like that yeah. with students in the future. You know what I mean? Yeah. Or with yourself. I had, a, I had an, an attending in when I was on internal medicine who did something very similar to that. Yep. And it, first of all, you're right. It made me like think 
very honestly because it's in the moment like what do I actually think that I did really well what do I actually think I need to improve right. on but it also made me feel like I mattered to the attending yeah and that they cared that I learned something and that I you know took something away from the rotation and so that I agreed totally that was great yep. another thing that the MSTP does for us to self-evaluate is that every year we have the, an IDP which is an individual development plan I think is what it stands for and as part of that you have to go through and like basically rate yourself on a scale of one to five mm you know, technical skills, communication skills, all these different things. And then you go through it with your mentor, like your primary mentor. And I think that that's can be helpful because you can score yourself one way and then you can hear someone else say, I actually think I don't, I don't think that my mentor has ever told me that I scored myself too high on something, but there have been times where there, where she's like, I don't agree. I think that you're better at this than you're giving yourself credit for. Yep. So I found that to be helpful. And honestly, like as I've gone on in my IDPs, I'm I've been less critical of myself a little bit. But I don't know, maybe that's bad. Maybe I'm slacking and now I'm just like, eh, I'm, uh, I'm good. That's hard. I you know, I'm thinking of our uh, you know, we're we're supposed to <laughs> Rachel and I are supposed to start doing our employee evaluations. We just talked about this. And yeah. I know Rachel, you were working on yours recently and I haven't even begun to think about that because I I dread it so but loosely. I'm loose like I well, read it. You've started. I read it. You've begun. And yeah, yeah, I guess the hardest part about that is is like understanding what it's really for. Yeah. And also, and also, sort of talking about yourself in a way that that is honest, but also doesn't sink you. <laughs> yeah, I think residency interviews are like a kind of similar parallel to that, where you're trying to be honest. But I was, I remember going through like practice questions that you might get asked in your interview, and a lot of them are like, "Tell me about a time things didn't go your way," or kind of these like pseudo negative things where you're trying to put a positive spin. And I found that was a really good time for reflection to kind of prepare for those questions. And I almost wish I did that all along the way. Because it'd probably be easier to even prepare for the interviews if it's like at the end of a rotation. I was like, you know what? Was there a time that something didn't go well here? Or how did I respond to feedback mm -hmm. on this rotation? Like mm -hmm. having those canned questions to think about. Because it's like a good state of self-reflection. But It's I, hard though because you, you have so little time. Yeah. To do that reflection in between clerkships or... Yeah, you have to build it into something for yourself. Like right. it's got to be specific for what works with you and your your bandwidth yeah right. you definitely need to be purposeful about any type of reflection that you do mm, yeah well and we were talking that like when we were to having this very brief performance review conversation dave it you know i said like i think it's better to receive feedback along the way yeah than like all at the end yeah. of every year a hundred percent it's one of the it's it's one of my pet peeves. Qualms. Agree. Yeah. Qualms. Yeah. yeah. And, yeah. and cause there's, there's so many times this is the med school process. I'm sure that it's not our institution. It's, it's the medical education process as a whole, but like there are times where you get feedback and you're like, great. I wish I would have had that two weeks ago right. or like before this situation had happened. Well, that's what I'm talking about when I say, you know, how do you evaluate yourself? Because you're, it's, that's often who it's left to is you. I think like, um, one thing that has been happening recently. So I think I mentioned that I'm doing some research on CTCL, which is like a kind of very rare, actually very rare lymphoma, but obviously Hopkins gets a lot of cases from the East coast. And so it basically like manifests in many different ways. It's like a chronic progressive condition. And one thing I learned from my mentor is she will like, especially because we're there, she'll like ask the patients, like, what can you like teach new trainees about like what you would like them to know? So it's a, I know it's like a different kind of evaluation. It's more like a patient centered evaluation than it would be like, you know, like you're the providers that you know rate us and judge us are evaluating different metrics than patients but i think it's actually been like extraordinarily helpful to just like talk to patients and like i've just started asking like you know like what you know what can you tell me about like what you would like me to know when talking about this or talking about that and i think that can give you know like that's like real-time feedback and i think it's so like, asking for it yeah and i think mm -hmm. it's like basically the same thing as talking to like an sp like where you would do the full interaction and then at the very end like right after you get feedback i thought that was like extraordinarily extraordinarily helpful in our training at carver yeah it's kind of the same thing as that and i think they're just like very very excited about that question too because especially patients with chronic conditions they've just like seen so many providers and they just know like what makes a good provider and what makes a bad provider especially for like these niche conditions i think it's just like very broadly applicable and i think I've learned a lot just by asking patients, like, what could I have asked you differently? Or like, what did you want to tell me that I didn't ask you? And like, I'm learning. So like, what can you teach me? And yeah, that's great. Yeah. The real time feedback from an SP is how I learned. I say, mm -hmm. okay, awesome. Every time they tell yeah. me a symptom, yeah. <laughs> I'm like, okay, yeah. I should stop doing that. Oh, sweet, really sweet symptom. Yeah. yeah. I think it's like 
almost like, I think, you know, like I was mentioning, I think the evaluation is obviously different from patients and providers, but I find it to be like very, I don't want to say more helpful, but like, I do find it to be very, very helpful because like patients will say, like say things that other providers have said to them that like, maybe they didn't appreciate or like, you know, or I really liked it when like a provider asked me about this, or like said this to me or like help me in this way. And you can kind of like get the best of, you know, multiple perspectives, I think just from talking to a patient. Yeah. I was helping with transition week this last week. So this Um, is the course that it's like a, basically a week long series of lectures about you know what to expect yeah. and how to excel on your rotations. And one of the things that they do or that they have just recently implemented is adding in the GU, the genital urinary exam, mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. to transition week. And I, so I was helping with that as a facilitator. And like at the end, after everybody like went through the exam, give a little bit of feedback, like how did that go? And I'm like, I actually really don't have much to add. I'm going to, you know, refer to our SP here who experienced the exam, who can give way better feedback than I can after just having watched you perform the exam that I'm, and what Ananya just said about asking patients about their experience really made me think about that. Like, I, I don't have any meaningful feedback to give you besides that it looked like you did it correctly. Looked good to me. Yeah. It's the, yeah, the, the facilitator equivalent of read more. Yeah, basically. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I have some thoughts about how to evaluate your own interpersonal skills and I just kind of came up with these. I, I I do think as, as we've sort of implied, you have to be purposeful about analyzing your, your, your social interactions and try to look at them at least semi objectively, you know, look for clues of understanding or even interest or even attempts to escape. <laughs> I can't tell you the number of times in my career where I've tried to escape social interactions or I've wanted to escape social interactions and felt like I was telegraphing it pretty well. And that message was not received. Received. Do you even have, I hate to say this, but do you even have close friends or colleagues? (laughs) I mean, do you have people that you spend more than just working time with, but also, you know, shooting the breeze for extended periods. I think that would be kind of an interesting clue to whether you're social, whether you are communicating properly with people or not. Do you understand what motivates people to, or does that puzzle you? I mean, I think a lot of times I find myself confused about people's motivation as to why they're behaving a certain way or why they're communicating in a certain way. But I console myself with the idea that, well, at least I'm trying to figure it out feels like an important skill. But yeah, the catch 22 to all of that, to all those ideas is it requires self-awareness, which I think is often something that people who have communication difficulties lacks. lack. Can I ask Rachel, yeah. where does that fall in the admissions process? Where does that question of evaluation of a prospective applicant's self-awareness, like where does that come out? Where does that jump mm. out to you? their self-awareness specifically so i think initially like in the writing Mm -hmm. right in your personal statement or even like a diversity statement or a disadvantage statement Mm -hmm. like those places that are more deeply personal than you describing an activity you were part of it's fairly obvious when there's a certain level of like surface level reflection versus a very developed thought out you can tell they spent time really thinking about whatever they're explaining or why whatever was impactful or why this was a challenging situation and this is what I learned or took away from it. But then in the interview, it's also evident when the candidates do get to sit face to face with interviewers and, you know, interviewers can comment like, you know, even based on body language or certain levels of confidence or overconfidence or underconfidence where, you know, they really seem like they have an, a solid understanding of, of medicine and they're really motivated and they were super excited about this activity or that activity. And this is what some of their goals are as a physician. And then others sometimes fall flat when they, you can tell they haven't done a lot of self-reflection because the answer is fairly thin, mm-hmm. Yeah, I guess. Yeah. Self-awareness is tricky. It really is. Yeah. I, you know, I think we, we all want to be the hero of our story and, or we all think we all want to be the main character. Yeah. And I just don't want to be the villain. Yeah. <laughs> Isn't that the truth? <laughs> For real. Yeah. I want to be the quirky best friend. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Can I be the sidekick in my own story? <laughs> Well, that's our show then. Mason, Eric, Maddie, Rachel, Nanya, thanks for being on the show with me today. 
What kind of disorganized, unprofessional, rude, closed-minded, confrontational, overly critical, self-aware dingus, self-unaware dingus would I be if I didn't thank you, short goats, for making us part of your week? If you're new here and you like what you heard today, follow us wherever fine podcasts are available, like Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts. And did you know we're on YouTube? I don't think you do because I'm not seeing any viewers. <laughs> thank you to this week's editor, Angela Mahoney. The show is made possible by a generous donation by Carver College of Medicine student government on ongoing support from the Writing and Humanities Program. And music is by Dr. Fox and Catmosphere. And I'm Dave Etler saying don't let the bastards get you down. Talk to you in one week. Hi, short coats. Look, life in medical education, life in America, life in the world is often difficult. And I often wish I could help. All I have is this podcast, but in my wildest dreams, you have the support you need to lead a life of your choosing. You deserve to be happy, healthy, and successful in whatever ways you define those words. So if you need support because you've experienced racism, discrimination, harassment, mental health crises, I want you to be able to get the help that you need. And so I'm going to put some links in the show notes to some resources that you can use But the bottom line is that, for what it's worth, I see you, I know you're out there, I wish I could do more. Maybe I can, in ways that I don't understand yet or know about, but I see you, and I'm glad you're here, and other people are too. This Short Code podcast is a proud member of the MedEd Media Network. Inspiration, information, and guidance on your journey to medical school and beyond at mededmedia.com.